On September 2nd, 1945, the Empire of Japan signed the terms of unconditional surrender put forward by the Allies, marking not only an end to the fighting in the Pacific Theater, but the official end of the Second World War. Japan's surrender was extraordinary, considering the nation's stance on war was always fighting until the last man, no matter the odds, a plan uh, which they'd even been preparing to employ on the Japanese mainland. Thankfully, the amphibious invasion of Japan oh, would never be necessary, and the avoidance of this bloodbath is generally credited to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which showed such overwhelming power that Japan's leadership had no choice but to give in. But this is a bit of an oversimplification, because the atomic bombs were just one of the reasons that Japan surrendered, with the other being the seemingly unstoppable storm of the Red Army moving through East Asia. After Germany surrendered, the Soviet Union turned their sights on Japan and unleashed one of their most successful operations of the entire war. Now, it can be hard to imagine a time of intense cooperation between the West and the Soviet Union, but having the Axis powers as a common enemy was more than enough to make a powerful, albeit hesitant, friendship between the nations. The leaders of the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union, known in World War II as the Big Three, are met in person on three occasions. The first was in Tehran, Iran, in 1943, during which Stalin agreed that the Soviet Union would enter the fight against Japan once Germany had fallen. By the time of the second conference, held in Yalta, Crimea, in early 1945, the Western Allies had liberated most of Western Europe, and the Soviets were nearly in Berlin, making the fall of the Third Reich no longer a question of if, but rather a question of when. With victory nearly at hand, the Big Three narrowed down the Soviet intervention in the East to within three months of Germany's defeat, agreed upon thanks to some discussions about the USSR reincorporating much of the land they would eventually be retaking. But. This would be far from the first time the Soviets had faced Japanese on the battlefield. The Russo-Japanese War before World War I had resulted in Japanese victory, which in conjunction with some false flag events and a couple of invasions led to Japan controlling Korea and Manchuria. There were several border clashes between the two countries, and there was no doubt that some bad blood remained, but a neutrality pact signed in 1941 allowed each nation to focus on their spheres of the war, with the Soviet Union needing as many troops as possible to defend against Germany and Japan needing its forces during its conquest of in the Pacific. But as the Soviets began building up military forces in the Far East in 1945, Japan feared that they would break this treaty and launch a surprise attack. However, Stalin reassured them that although they did not wish to renew the pact, they would honor the agreed-upon 12-month notice before ending it. With this confirmation, Japan withdrew many of their elite and experienced troops from Manchuria, sending them to fight in their depleted Pacific ranks, where the situation against the US was starting to look rather dire. But Japan's worries grew as they watched the Red Army continue to swell in the east. They repeatedly approached the Soviets and tried to convince them to renew the non-aggression pact, offering everything from territorial concessions to some tantalizing peace offers. However, anything short of unconditional surrender was of little interest to the Allies, and so the Soviets, while drawing out these proposals as long as they possibly could, had absolutely no intention of agreeing to any of them, as the plans for the attack were already being prepared. So to understand the scale of the attack that unfolded, you need to understand just how big the territory held by Japan was in 1945. Including Manchuria, Korea, and Inner Mongolia, the Soviets would be operating on a scale about the same size as the entire Western European theater. Due to Japan's faltering defenses there, they were about to take it with astonishing speed. Despite having been absolutely ravaged by the war in Europe, the USA USSR still had plenty of men for this next big operation, and throughout the summer of 1945, hundreds of thousands of men boarded trains headed to the Far East, training and preparing in bases set up in eastern Russia and Mongolia. Much of this was done with some secrecy to avoid Japanese suspicion, but the sheer amount of men likely gave away some of their intention to spies monitoring their movements. By August, the Soviet Union had gathered a staggering 80 divisions, amounting to 1.5 million men. But just before the deadline for Stalin's attack, something happened that changed the world. On August the 6th, the atomic bomb nicknamed Little Boy exploded over Hiroshima, unleashing a blast equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT. The United States had just shown their ace, and it was hoped that it would force Japan's hand in surrendering before an invasion of the home islands had to be initiated. But Stalin wasn't concerned with this. Even if Japan's surrender seemed likely, the invasion of Manchuria was not simply a favor he was performing for the Allies, it was a bit personal. Since Japan had taken land from the Russian Empire many years ago, Stalin saw this operation as the perfect opportunity to not only take revenge, but to ensure that the USSR would gain significant influence in post-war Asia, just as it had in post-war Europe. 
At one minute past midnight on the 9th of August, just hours before Nagasaki would suffer the same fate as Hiroshima, Soviet divisions crossed the border into Japanese territory and officially declared war on Japan. The plan, drawn up by Soviet Marshal Alexander Vasilevsky, was a massive, three-pronged pincer movement launching from three main points to the west, the east, and the north of Manchuria. The goal was simple blitz through the occupied land, slicing the territory up with such speed that the Japanese forces were completely overwhelmed. But if you know anything about Japan in the Second World War, you know that giving up easily was the last thing they would ever consider. Despite being outnumbered, Japan's Kwantung army still commanded an estimated 700,000 troops in the region, and they were prepared to put up a fight, having mostly retreated to cities that they deemed strongholds, hoping that the rough terrain on the borders would slow down the advancing Soviets. But they couldn't have been more wrong. Exceeding their own expectations, the Red Army thundered through the landscape, crossing rivers, navigating mountain ranges, and even riding across the deserts of Mongolia, accompanied by 16,000 Mongolian troops. Most Japanese divisions were caught entirely by surprise, especially since many of their leaders were away at a training exercise, further confounding the problems the occupiers were about to face. The storm of the Red Army crushed the light resistance it encountered on the outskirts of the territory, and despite moving at such a rapid pace, their airborne units were even quicker, with paratroopers dropping behind enemy lines and securing airfields ahead of the ground forces. But not every city would be captured so easily, and one holdout did turn into a bit of a stubborn thorn. At the town of Hylar, the Japanese put up a formidable resistance and fought with such ferocity that even the Red Army was taken aback. When the Japanese realized that their 37mm and 47mm anti-tank guns were only useful against the lighter Soviet tanks bouncing off the heavier ones, they resorted to suicide bomber squads as their improvised anti-tank weapon, strapping men with grenades and other explosives explosives and having them sprint at Soviet armor. There are also reports that the Japanese used kamikaze planes, though their air power was severely limited in the region. Regardless, this suicidal determination was a cultural aspect of war that the Soviets had not encountered against Germany, and it took some time to adjust to it. Hylar would continue holding on for the rest of the operation. Everywhere else, however, the Kwantung army was outnumbered, outgunned, and completely outmatched. So, in just a single day, the Soviets had crossed most of the defenses created by the natural terrain entering the plains of central Manchuria. This is where the majority of the Japanese forces were concentrated, and not by coincidence, also where the three Soviet advances intended to meet. By now, the Kwantung army was in utter chaos. Many divisions had been completely severed from communication lines, left to decide their own fate, and many others were overwhelmed so quickly that they were encircled in mere hours. The situation on the mainlands, with Nagasaki being bombed the morning of the operation's beginning, certainly didn't help, and the leadership there were slow to muster any sort of official orders. As the Red Army marched on, a few cities, such as Sufane, held out for a few days, but only just long enough to allow the majority of the men to retreat southward and avoid complete annihilation. After about a week of combat, Japanese forces in Manchuria turned on their radios and received a message that none of them had expected to hear. Emperor Hirohito had recorded the Gyokong Hoso, a radio broadcast on August 15th that announced the following. We've ordered our government to communicate to the governments of the United States, Great Britain, China, and the Soviet Union that our empire accepts the provisions of their joint declaration. The broadcast went on to mention the new and cruel bomb invented by the Allies and how Japan will mourn those who have been lost in battle. But despite its intent, the broadcast crucially failed to directly announce an unconditional surrender. Yes, accepting the provisions of a joint declaration is what this means, but the common Japanese soldier was not aware of the complex negotiations between the nations at war. It also didn't help that the emperor recorded the broadcast in classical Japanese with pronunciation unfamiliar to many regular people. All of this left the message rather unclear to soldiers on the battlefield, and that's why in Manchuria they continued to fight. But even when an official ceasefire was finally relayed to the region, personally delivered by Japan's prince, many officers resisted it, deeming it dishonorable, and pockets of resistance dug in for the long haul. Though, because the Soviets were aware of the official surrender, they mostly began to avoid these holdouts and instead isolated them while pushing for maximum territorial gain before the war could end. As Manchuria collapsed under the Soviet swarm, the Red Army initiated the next phase of their assault on Japan with amphibious landings in Korea, South Sakhalin, and the Kuril Islands. Troops rushing up the beaches of Korea were under orders to secure critical infrastructure as the rest of the army caught up on land, and despite the main advance not quite being able to reach Korea, stretching their supply lines a bit thin and stopping just short of the Yalu River, the forces deployed on the amphibious landings were able to take control of much of the peninsula all on their own. And they likely had the firepower to continue marching south through the rest of Korea, but they stopped at the 38th parallel as they'd agreed to leave what would become South Korea for the Americans to administer. 
By August the 20th, the operation was complete, with the final cities falling to the Soviets, even the fortifications at Haila, which had proven so tough just 10 days earlier. In just over a week, the Red Army had crushed the entire Japanese resistance in an area larger than the entire nation of Egypt. The Soviets suffered around 30,000 casualties, and while Japanese casualty numbers are not known, the USSR claims to have inflicted over 100,000. What is known for sure is that hundreds of thousands of Japanese soldiers were taken prisoner at the war's end, many of which were deported to Siberian labor camps, from which they'd never return. In the war-torn provinces, along with numerous mass graves of Chinese civilians, the Soviets happened to stumble upon Unit 731, the infamous biological and chemical weapons research program known for its cruel and outright horrifying experiments on anyone that they could get their hands on. The experimenters attempted to destroy as much evidence as possible, but the Red Army captured them before it could all be erased. Though it must be noted that the Japanese soldiers weren't the only ones committing war crimes in the region. The Red Army was guilty of looting, raping, and terrorizing the local populations in both Manchuria and Korea with their superiors turning a blind eye. On multiple occasions, police from the Chinese Communist Party arrested and even killed Soviet soldiers for these alleged crimes, though the scale was simply too large to fully stop it. In the Gegenma massacre, Soviet soldiers slaughtered over a thousand Japanese women and children, even using heavy weapons against them. And horrifyingly similar to events that unfolded during the Battle of Okinawa, Japanese mothers were recorded to have killed their own children to keep them from falling into the hands of the invading forces, while other civilians were outright executed by their own army to spare them the shame of surrender. Now, ever since the unconditional surrender of Japan, historians have debated the role of the Soviet invasion in influencing this decision. Some say that the atomic bombs alone were enough to force the emperor's hand in capitulating, while others say that the pressure exerted by the Red Army on Japan's occupied territories was a key part of pressuring the nation into surrendering. This debate will continue regardless of what we say in this video, but it should be pointed out that perhaps the most important part of the operation was not how lightning fast it was, how many casualties piled up, or how much territory was taken, but simply the fact that it was launched in the first place. The moment Japan knew that the Soviet Union would no longer act as a third party in negotiations with the Americans as they'd hoped, they knew their days were numbered. But on that day that Stalin agreed to attack Japan, much more was set into motion than just a factor that would lead to Japan's surrender. His decision to enter the war in the East ultimately shaped history in several surprising ways. Manchuria, for example, was later handed over to communist China, deepening the relationship between the ideological brothers at the time and granting significant territory to the communist fighters who used the land in their fight in the Chinese Civil War, which they eventually won, which, long story short, has led to the current tensions between China and Taiwan. The Kuril Islands, annexed at the end of the war, are a territorial dispute between Russia and China even to this day. And in Korea, agreeing to split the peninsula with the Americans ultimately led to the Korean War, when North Korea crossed the 38th parallel in June 1950, a war which completely soured relations between the United States and the Soviet Union and arguably kick-started the Cold War. If the Soviets hadn't intervened in the East, East Asia could look very, very different today. It's even possible that an invasion of the Japanese home islands would have been necessary, a battle which, had it been carried out, would have easily ranked among the deadliest in all of human history.